What does this mean for Wisconsin? This is a question I get a lot. Individual health plans are no longer able to continue or enroll new people into them. So for the 292,000 people in Wisconsin who buy their insurance on their own in the individual market, this compromises that kind of insurance. Health savings accounts, meaning high deductible health plans with tax preferred accounts underneath, like flexible spending accounts, health reimbursement accounts, and health savings accounts, those are not considered acceptable coverage under this bill, and that puts that kind of coverage in jeopardy for 232,000 people in Wisconsin. The employer mandates will impact 67% of Wisconsin small business employees, and even with the health care tax credits that the bill makes available to small businesses, there's a very small tax credit for very small, small businesses. That affects about 19% of businesses. What are the long-term consequences? The government pays for nearly half of all health care costs right now. Under this bill, it grows exponentially faster, much quicker. The goal of this bill, from its authors and from the advocates, are to reduce health care spending by 30% over the next two decades, achieved by eliminating, quote, high-cost, low-value treatments. Okay, what does that mean? That means, under a system like this, which creates 53 new programs, commissions, and government agencies, um, it's these agencies that will design how health care is to be reimbursed and how physicians and hospitals will practice medicine and under what circumstances how they'll be paid for it. Um, one idea that's already been implemented, which is in the stimulus bill, is this new government agency called the Competitive Effectiveness Research Institute. That is a new agency designed to determine how doctors will uh, basically handle medicine, how they will assign treatments to people under what circumstances. Now, the word rationing uh, gets thrown around a lot. It's a fairly loaded term, healthcare rationing. And people in this debate on both sides embellish this term uh, on both sides of it. Uh, I think that the question to ask that I get asked is this. Does this bill uh, explicitly contain health care rationing so that the government rations your health care? No, it does not express, expressly or explicitly contain health care rationing. Um, do the authors of this bill, does the president want the government to ration your health care? No, I don't think he does and I don't think they do. Will this bill lead to and require rationing of health care? And I think unequivocally the answer is yes. That's the problem, among others, that I have with this legislation. This, this bill, remember, this puts the government in the position of either being the single or primary payer of health care. Backstop that with the fiscal problem we have, with the enormous unfunded liabilities of Medicare and Medicaid, and it's health care spending that is the largest driver of America's fiscal problems of our debt, of our deficit. And the only way to solve that problem under this kind of an architecture, under this kind of a system, with the government as the primary or single payer of health care, is to ration care based on cost, is to have these agencies that are being created in this bill determine under what circumstances health care will be delivered for patients based upon cost considerations. And so, no, it's not the intention of the authors of this bill to do health care rationing, but it is, the, it is the inevitable outcome of this legislation. And that, to me, is a real problem. So, let me just simply say, there are problems in health care that have got to get fixed. Nobody should deny that. Look, we've got people in America that are going without insurance that need insurance. That should be fixed. We've got people in America that have pre-existing conditions. You know, you may have had breast cancer eight years ago. You got type 2 diabetes. You got arthritis. And you can't get health care, or if you could, it will cost you half your income. That's a problem. That should be fixed, too. And we also have a situation in our country, in our city, in our state, where you have no idea what things cost. I mean, really, you don't know what the MRI is going to cost at Dean, what it's going to cost at Mercy, what the hip replacement, what the bypass is going to cost, who's good, who's bad. So we've got a lot of problems that need to be fixed. My point in saying this is, we should have the ability, I would like to think, to fix what's broken in healthcare without breaking what's working in healthcare. And that is what I want to achieve. Now, many of us have offered alternatives. I have offered a very comprehensive bill called the Patient's Choice Act. I've got an elaborate PowerPoint presentation. I can go on that. But I don't want to kill you with PowerPoint presentations. I'd be more than happy to go into that in detail if you'd like me to. The simple point I'm making is I believe we can have a system, which my bill demonstrates, and there are other people in Congress who have offered other versions of these kinds of ideas, which says that you can have a system 
where people who have pre-existing conditions can get affordable health care, where people who don't have health insurance in America can get health insurance in America. You can do it without massive new taxing, massive new borrowing or spending than what we already do, and you can do it without putting the government in the place of controlling and running our health care sector. That, to me, is what we ought to do. We should scrap this bill, in my personal opinion, and start over. And with that, I'd be happy to answer your questions.